We have an enormous panel of really fantastic and experienced professionals up here. So we're excited to get to spend two hours with you on this topic around how do we harness data to really uh, show evidence of our impact as nonprofits. Um, we will take a break in the middle of that because I know two hours is a long time to sit after lunch. Um, and before we dive in, I, I can just share a little bit about myself. My name is Katie. Um, I run an organization here in New York called Community Resource Exchange, or CRE. We are a nonprofit ourselves and also a nonprofit consulting firm. So we support around this past year 500 organizations to be stronger in achievement of their missions. And we do all sorts of um, organizational development and strategy and management support for the nonprofits and foundations and some government agencies that we serve, really around strategy, planning, different OD topics like financial management and talent management, risk management, diversity, equity, and inclusion, all the different facets that you, know, you as nonprofit professionals, I'm sure, are thinking about across your organization every day. We work in those areas. We are not tech experts, and I think that's actually why I was asked to moderate these panels. Um, so my job is to, ooh, ooh, sorry. My job is to really help keep the conversation um, at the org strategy purpose level, right around tying everything back to mission and, and impact, which is why a nonprofit exists. Um, I know many of you are full on tech experts and can, can bring in a lot of the details around the different transformations that you've been working on within your organizations and that will be really helpful for the conversation and I'll warn in advance that I'll keep trying to bring us up but I also want you all to stop me if I've misinterpreted something, mm -hmm. particularly on the tech side. So can we all agree to that? Yep. Great. All right. So, so without further ado, to, to introduce this panel, um, our, the title of the panel right, is called Harnessing the Power of Data. And it's thinking about how do we help our nonprofit organizations better provide evidence to show that we are making an impact and do that in a way that matters for number one. I always argue the most important point, which is to assess if we're actually making progress towards achieving our mission, right? So for our own management and um, assessment of if we're achieving our outcomes. But number two, to communicate back to the many different stakeholders we have to communicate with to be successful as nonprofits, which includes donors, includes external partners, includes your board members, um, the different clients that you might might support. Um, as a side note, I'll use client and beneficiary interchangeably. Um, and it can even include government institutions and in those you might be trying to influence for further policies and, and things of that nature, right? So there's a whole host of folks that we've got to worry about communicating with, and I think that data is critical to it. And then, of course, I should note too, of course, e your internal staff, right? And making sure that everyone is on the same page and knows where you're going, what you're achieving, or maybe what you're not, and then how to fix it. Um, so that is the purpose of this panel. Um, and so we've got a, a bunch of folks up here who will, will help us through this conversation. To my left, I have Justin, who we just heard from from Microsoft. So uh, you know a little bit about him already. Then we've got Ernest. Oh, no, I'm already in the wrong order. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> Kyle Turk from LifeWorks in Austin. And then Ernest Astro from International Rescue Committee, or IRC. Erica Adams. And then Ashwini Kirpalani, both from the Commit Partnership. And then we have Lori Kunick from AKA Enterprise Solutions. So um, what we'll do is we'll start by asking the different um, nonprofit leads up here to talk us a little, a little bit about your organizations and your mission, your role at your organization. Um, and then I'll dive into specific questions around uh, the type of work that you have been doing around data in, in a showing an evidence-based model, if that makes sense. So um, Kyle, can we start with you if you'll just share with us um, a little bit about LifeWorks. We saw the wonderful video, um, the blockbuster that, that we were just talking about that it is, um, and why, why there's actually was started, the mission, and your role there. Excellent. Is this, does this sound okay? <laughs> okay. I'm the IT director at LifeWorks. We work with youth between 16 and 26 years of age. They're typically either critically homeless or aging out of foster care, so it's a particularly vulnerable uh, population. Our mission is to achieve self-sufficiency. Uh, we have a standardized assessment that we've developed uh, along with the Arizona, uh, University of Arizona in achieving uh, what does SSM or self-sufficiency look like. Uh, we have 30 programs and three divisions. The three divisions are housing, counseling, and education. Each one of those programs we hold to an evidence-based model which itself lends to a whole bunch of metrics, right? How many touches a case management has, what assessments they have. So that rolls up into achieving our mission, which is self-sufficiency. So we've been uh, very lucky to have a board and a, and a strategic management team 
that uh, believes in data, that has seen what metrics can do and prove that we are achieving our mission. We can prove that to our donors. And so all the products um, and processes that are included in achieving those types of metrics, I'm in charge of. So that's where my role is in, in LifeWorks. These are long-term solutions. So not only am I in the minutia of the day-to-day, -day, but I also call it the keeper of the flame. Right? I've seen the mountaintop, and i got to make sure that all the processes we develop today move us towards the mountaintop. Thanks. Next. Um, hi, everyone. Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, so, uh, Ernest Oster, I'm the Director of Applications at the International Rescue Committee. Um, we are a humanitarian aid, or, aid organization, and we respond to some of the world's worst humanitarian crises in the world. Um, and that's everything from a 72-hour response in crisis to help save lives through to really helping people rebuild their lives um, through long-term education, health, or economic programs. Um, one of the things we one of the things that's unique about IRC is we both do a lot of international crisis response in 40 countries around the world. Um, we're also one of the resettlement agencies in the U.S. that is taking in refugees and helping them be placed and thrive within a U.S. society. Um, the other thing to note about IRC, we're pretty large. We have between 12 and 25,000 staff, depending on how you count them exactly. We work in 40 different countries. Um, we do a whole range of programs. So from a data point of view, it's a pretty complex environment in terms of how do you bring health and education and governance and power um, statistics together and kind of build a body of evidence on that. So one of the things you can do is look at our outcomes and evidence framework, which is published online. But evidence is at the heart of our 2020 strategy. Um, what I manage is applications, which is sort of the entire application suite, although pieces of it um, we just help inter, um, make sure they're integrated into an overall model. So we're implementing Dynamics 365. We have a team that's dedicated to that, and what we're mostly doing is making sure the data and how it works with other systems is working. Um, we also do software development in our team, which is really good because that lets us be, give some things that really delight people. Um, we also have data and analytics in there and what's called um, ICT or information and communication technology for programs. Thanks. Erica Adams, uh, I am with the Commit Partnership and the Managing Director of Strategic Relationships. The Commit Partnership is an education collective impact model based in Dallas, Texas. And while we started as a Dallas-based organization, we also do a lot of work with the state of Texas around education issues. And just to give you a sense of scale, Texas educates 5 million students, uh, and that is roughly 10% of the nation's kids. So that's a pretty big charge that we hold in our hands. And to take that very seriously, we look at an education pipeline that starts from birth all the way to and through college. And my colleague, Ashmina, will talk a little bit more about the 11 indicators that we use to hold ourselves and our partners accountable to those students. So we track everything from kindergarten readiness through third grade reading, uh, high school access, high school graduation, college and career access and readiness. Uh, within those pathways and within those 11 indicators, we found through data that there are three strategic areas that we really need to focus on. The first is early. Early childhood education is key to setting a strong foundation for how a student will progress through life. Just to give you a sense, for every dollar that you invest in early childhood, we see a return on investment anywhere from seven to $13 for every single one that you invest. So we start early and we focus very strongly in that area. The second is educator effectiveness. I think we can all name an amazing teacher, an amazing principal who set you off on the right path. You can't have successful schools without having successful people within those classrooms. And the third is college and career access and completion. So not just getting kids to the college door, but getting them to complete a four-year, a two-year, a certification, something that puts them on a sustainable lifetime earning pathway. If we're able to do that for our students, and Texas has set a goal of 60 by 30, which is 60% of our students and our young adults having uh, an education pathway by 2030, if we're able to receive, like, reach that goal, we'll see $2 billion more, or $200 billion more, in earnings returned to the state of Texas. So we operate in a coalition model, uh, a federation model, just that we bring together over 200 partners in Dallas alone and try to move their indicators and their data into one common language. Because when you're talking to early childcare providers and a district on how they're 
uh, grading third grade literacy or kindergarten readiness, you'll see a range of answers. So we have to deal not only in publicly available data, but in organizing that data against what everybody else is talking about, and then translating that into a way that makes sense, not only to ourselves, but then to those partners and to policy stakeholders. If anybody really wants to have a good time, come down to Texas right now. We're in the middle of state session. Uh, we like to say it's the best free form of entertainment that our state has to offer. <laughs> we already have Twitter fights going on. There's popcorn involved. You'll be very excited and not disappointed. Um, so my role within the organization is strategic relationships. Uh, that can be code for fundraising. It can also be code for policy, for implementation, as well as front of the house and back of the house, connecting financial institutions, financial resources, as well as the metrics that say whether or not we're actually doing what we showed up to do. Um, and I'm Ashwini Kirpalani, and I lead the analytics team. Our organization is less about the technology side of the work and much more, uh, like Erica said, about the communication side. So how do we take existing data that's out there and change the conversation? So how do we communicate that one in, excuse me, four in 10 students can read on grade level in Texas and create the momentum around, for example, funding education, so my team is very much less on the technology. We lean on AKA and Microsoft to support us. But what we do is take existing data and make it actionable. Thank you. Sure. Before we dive further into the case studies with each of your organizations, I'd love, Justin and Laura, if you could just briefly you know, share your role in working with these groups in, in relation to the digital transformations with nonprofits generally. I yeah, I think I kind of did, so I won't go over, yeah. over old ground, but um, we've, we've partnered with, through our partner, AKA, with each of these organizations to support them um, on an end-to-end -end basis. So we'll, well, I think we'll get into that as we go through that. But. Um, I, my, I guess, uh, relationship to this is with the International Rescue Committee predominantly, and I'm also involved in AKA's nonprofit um, vertical line of business, meaning I go out and meet with a lot of nonprofits. Um, and help manage that. But with IRC, I've been involved in that project um, off and on for the last two years. Um, and in through that, you know, and in meeting with other nonprofits, definitely seeing the need. Everybody thinks they're different. They think their challenges are, oh, but, you know, we're so bad off or we don't have what we need. Yeah. And they find through talking to each other that it's a consistent theme. I mean, we're all in this together. I think the more we can connect nonprofits, we will be more successful. Um, I am seeing stuff in the last two years from Microsoft that, to me, are really game-changing. And they're ga game-changing for industries that don't have a lot of money to spend on the technology. And this is what's really important because the more we can become efficient, the better off we can serve our beneficiaries. And so, to me, this is some really exciting stuff that you guys that are so close to the source, it's, it's amazing to watch the transformation and how, in the end, together we can totally achieve a whole lot of success for a lot of people across the world, so. Thanks. So, you know, we keep talking about this word transformation, digital transformation, and, and each of your organizations has gone through that, as I understand it, from the work that, that you've been doing with AK and Microsoft. So maybe if we could just dive in there a little bit, and I'd, I'd, I'd ask if each of you could share with us, before you started these projects, what type of data were you collecting? Um, what was or wasn't working about it? What was the volume of data? How frequently were you collecting it, et cetera? And then what was the primary driver that made you decide to pursue this type of major project for your organization? Um, and then from that, just tell us a little bit about what you did so we get that view too. Maybe we'll start with the Commit Partnership and work back this way. Yeah, absolutely. We received about 25 million records from the state of Texas of student achievement data. And like I said, what we work on typically is aggregate data and we provide descriptive statistics back to the education landscape. And so we were sitting on this treasure trove of data, not knowing, not having the skills to work with it. Um, and step in Microsoft and AKA. And what we did together was put the data into Azure so that we could then use HD insights to pull out insights from um, the very large data set. One of the major findings that we had within the data set was that in third grade, uh, the achievement for a student within third grade has a 70% correlation with eighth grade reading achievement. So if a student is able to read by third grade, mm -hmm. they can then, we know 70% of the time that they will be able to read in eighth grade. And so that's great to know on a sheet of paper, and that's wonderful. 
but then how do we act on it? Um, and so we took the work that AKA the Microsoft team and then also another organization that we work with, DataKind, um, to share that out with uh, the legislature so that we can now start talking about how do we make sure that third graders in Texas, every single third grader, is able to achieve on grade level. Alex. Just to contextualize that a, a little bit further with what Ashmina is telling you. So TEA is our Texas Education Agency. That's our state education agency. They went searching for somebody to have use of this data set. It's 25 million records. And Ashmina aptly named it a treasure trove. This is data dating back to when, when was the first record? Like the 80s? 2012. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> it was five years, five, six years of data uh, for every single student in the state of Texas. But to be able to crunch that down for a state agency, to pull out predictive pieces of information, to then go back to the legislature at a time when Texas is looking at changing the way they actually fund public schools and provide legislati a legislative body a roadmap to say, here's a place that you need to make a really big bet. And you've got to change the way that you fund, the way that you incentivize, the way that you hold accountable school districts and school entities to get them to a third grade reading level. Before it was more of a stick, less of a carrot, and just say we have to hold you accountable in this whole mix of other accountability metrics. This gives a very concrete point in time to say everybody needs to hit this target and here's why. It will get you to eighth grade, and eighth grade will get you to high school graduation, which will get you to a career certificate. Right? And we could not have done that without a lot of this predictive analytics that AKA and Microsoft was able to, to provide for us. And just, just one kind of really pragmatic point to amplify. A lot of the first steps that we see with organizations is, is just getting the data, in this case you had a data set, into the cloud to start to use some of the analytics tools to get insights. We did the same thing with uh, sudden infant death syndrome. It turns out that there's a record, it is since 1983, actually, so it's the See, 80s. 80s are in there. there yeah, there's, there's a record of every child born, you probably, I, I learned this, uh, since like 1983. And there's all these attributes and indicators, child weight, um, a bunch of different things. We were able to ingest that, not Microsoft, this was with, done with uh, Seattle Children's Hospital, John Hopkins and others ingest that into Azure, and just as you, you did, start to understand things that we couldn't see before in that very large data set. And now doctors can pinpoint down to the cigarette uh, the correlative factor on SIDS, uh, which is a new insight that they've gained. So step one, get to the cloud. Step two, start using some of the basic intelligent frameworks in the cloud built in Azure Intelligent Services or whatever service you're using uh, to get those insights. Yeah, and, and the team was able to pull out a lot, many more insights. So thinking about various demographics around each of the students, economics, um, race, gender, et cetera. So yeah. it was, yeah, it was, it was quite difficult. And are you using the data that you now have these insights mm -hmm. from um, for things other than influencing policy at the government level? You know, how else are you using it in your operations? We brought together early childhood providers as well, or early childhood educators and said, here is what we're seeing with the data set from the state of Texas. And their answer was, duh. <laughs> of course we're seeing that, right? We know that now. Exactly. We, now we can and prove and it. So for them, um, they anecdotally knew it. And yeah. I think what having the data sit behind the anecdotes was the real power. Um, I feel like the other piece is when we're, Texas Education Agency provided this data to us, but has never seen it. So next week, in a couple of weeks, I'm heading up to Austin or heading down to Austin to go and speak with the Texas Education Agency and share back the data set that they gave us um, and say, look at what we can do together. That's so AKA, be ready. <laughs> <laughs> I think after the duh, and of course we knew that <laughs> moment, was also a thank you because now I can tell everybody else and they can believe me. Yeah. And we can rally funding sources that are not just public dollars but private dollars it validates for previous investors that this was the right place to place their, you know, their marker down. And it also gives you a bigger box to stand on when you're talking about what people generally believe to be small issues right? and small things that can be done. But if you change the small things because of this insight, we know it'll change the bigger things. Yeah. That's great, thanks. 
In earnest, too, if you'll start with the data you collected, how, what worked, what didn't, and then what you did with it. So, so it's a little tricky to answer that question because we work in so many different areas in terms sure. of the quality of data. I mean, we do everything from we manage health clinics in Kakama in a refugee camp in northern Kenya through to primary health care clinics through to system strengthening work in West Africa around Ebola. So I'll start instead with a story that just kind of illustrates this. And when I first got into the sector, um, I went to Nairobi, which as many of you know, is sort of thought of as the higher data end of the international development sector. Mm -hmm. And I talked to our M&E manager there, and he told me this amazing story as his sort of hero journey for one piece of data. And USAID had questioned the number of people that were receiving HIV treatment in this one hospital. And it was a sort of late on a Friday, and the, and the report was due back from the USAID locally to New York on the weekend. And so he had driven around Nairobi and found, you know, he'd gone to bars, he'd gone to restaurants, he'd gone everywhere. And finally, he'd found the nurse that was in charge of this ward, and he'd managed to get this piece of data out, and he knew the number was right. He could put it back in his M&E system and say, yes, this is working. And he was telling me this story, and he was talking about how great this was and sort of how amazing this journey was. And he would found this number, and he's telling me all this detail. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, this is a disaster. Like, <laughs> how on earth can you build a system based on this? This is, this is a nightmare. Um, and he thought, you know, I was, I was really enthusiastically behind him. And unfortunately, I was the whole time thinking, this is just never going to scale. So I think part of that is to say, there's still a lot of that in the sector, in our sector. Mm -hmm. And so what's exciting about things like the CDM and I think seeing what I call the enterprise nature of coming to measurement. So taking an enterprise approach instead of what I call a sort of Excel spreadsheet and let's try our best approach. And that means things like looking at the transactional layer that's often missing in our work. So that means things like getting to case management, being able to trust that we can do identification properly, which means we can improve services, which means we can gather data, which means we can look at it properly. And that requires a transformational enterprise approach that there have been a lot of pieces of it there, but hasn't really come together in an overall model yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the overall impact for us, and that's sort of where we start from. Now, at IRC, we've um, had a data project that's been going for the last four years. It's had some really good pieces and some struggles, to be honest. Um, I think there's a, as of when I checked last, which was a couple of weeks ago, we're, we're gathering around 72,000 pieces of data a week go into our system, right? We have challenges with data quality. There's a lot of stuff we could do with AI to look at those kinds of things. So we're gathering a lot of data. We have a lot of different, um, different systems around the world, everything from fairly um, sophisticated ones. Our Pakistan Reading Project, which was a project to retrain several million children for reading levels in Pakistan and retrain teachers also. Um, we distributed 23,000 tablets as an example. We have a lot of good data from that that we could use. So we have a lot of disparate data sources that we're bringing to the cloud. We're looking at how we can start to analyze them and looking at our staff capacity so that we can also raise our analytical capability partner with different agencies such as AKA and Microsoft directly as to what, what can we derive from this. So I think we're yeah. sort of a step back from having this sort of conversation with the legislature based on our data, but we've got a lot of good things coming together. We're a lot of good sort of industry partners we're working with, um, so we're very excited about where we're going. And so what are the critical steps that you are taking or about to take to, to get closer to having data that you can use? or why? Or do you think it'll continue to be kind of in pockets at this point? I think it's a great question. I think there are parts that, we'll, that we can do worldwide. I mean, people tend to look at it. If I, I don't know if there are any M&E managers in the room, you know, and sort of look at it from an indicator base. So we're looking at some core global indicators. And also then we've got a lot of, pro, a lot of um, project indicators, a lot of government indicators. I think when um, we were in our global data system, about 8% installed, so this is the latest number I had. We already had 15,000 indicators in the system that we were collecting, which is fundamentally nuts. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can't manage 15,000 indicators. Right. Um, but it gives you a sense of sort of the starting point and the complexity. Yeah. And some of that, I think, when you look at it from a data-centric point of view, as opposed to an m and &E or program-centric, you get some real ability to transform your thinking about what's important, and what do you need to measure, as opposed to what have you just always been measuring, or did somebody ask you to, or you had a meeting where everyone said, oh, could we do that too? Yeah. I, I think, not to editorialize on top of everybody's <laughs> comment here, but I think one, you, you've made a really important point. How many people in this room operate in an affiliated structure? So you're multiple organizational entities distributed across. Come on, more hands than that. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's okay. It's um, a safe space. <laughs> so 
a lot of organizations do. And we talked about how do we get data into the cloud, uh, kind of a step one, but how do you actually get data out of the field before you get it and into the cloud? And so this, this strategy that IRC is deploying, but also Oxfam as another organization is taking a very intentional step here, is a, is a data hub strategy. So start with getting the data from the field, getting it into the cloud. You're gonna learn that you have 15,000 indicators that you probably need to rationalize, but it, it gives you some of those insights and allows you, creates a base that you can progress from um, through the instantiation of common data models and other technologies. Um, we're gonna be looking at investing in reference architectures for data hubs to help organizations that are affiliated um, create best practices on how do I create a hub and spoke model um, and create low footprint, low bandwidth applications at the edge to collect the data from the field, get it rationalized into an Azure data structure or data lake structure, and then start to do basic visualization on top of that. Again, you don't need to, your starting point isn't ripping and replacing your ERP or your CRM or your core infrastructure. Your starting point is getting out of the number one data system, which is Excel, right? And getting it into the cloud uh, from all of your endpoints so that you can start to think about how that can be rationalized. So I think that's, that was your, that's your journey that you're on. Yeah, absolutely, and, and you know, we, we talk a lot in all of those Excel spreadsheets. We're not talking about a spreadsheet that somebody's thrown together that day to gather a few points. These are multi-year yeah. efforts. They're gorgeous. I'm, I'm blown away by what I see. But they don't have sustainability, have turnover. You have all the typical issues. So what we do as a sector is we reinvent flat tires. Yeah. Exactly. And so getting it into the cloud, sparking that conversation, thinking about a common data model instead is what starts to build the sort of consensus necessary to do that. And one thing I'll just put a pin in that I'd like to come back to, I'm curious to know for folks in the room too, is when you're doing some of these projects, how often are folks first stepping back and saying, what do we even need to measure versus we're tracking <laughs> 72,000 pieces of data a week? How much of that actually matters? Are those actually outcomes to begin with? Right? Are these outputs? Are, these, are the operational KPIs, key performance indicators that we need? So can I just see a quick show of hands? How many of you in your organizations have had that conversation around what data do we actually need? OK, so most. That's great. Sometimes when I ask um, groups that we work with that question, oh, whatever we have to supply for our reports which is great, <laughs> but what your donors want is not necessarily what helps you manage well, your And there's another point there, which is the truth is in the field, right? So you have to ask yourself, what do we need? But then you ask that, also have to ask, ask yourself, what are people actually doing and using? And, and you have to iterate between those two realities, I think, um, because the one thing I've learned in, in building solutions uh, in any space, but this space in particular, is the truth is with the field. And they've got well ingrained practices and models that um, you're going to need to take into consideration. So. Yep, no, that's right. And it yeah. also should link back to your theory of change as an organization right. for your program models, right? Which I know you all know, but just to say. Okay. Kyle, sorry, over to you. Well, you'll talk a little bit about the data that you all were collecting yeah. before you embarked on your transformation. I mean, so uh, I, we've gone on this journey for about two years now, and um, I'm seeing a lot of synergies here. We had a director of research before we had a director of IT because they were able to gather the data and then make sense of it. We also did have 15,000 data points, but we had a lot. And, you know, grant cycles turn, and we were able to say, the correlation between the three, third grade, you know, reading level and eighth grade reading level is this. This is what we should be measuring. And we were able to dictate the terms of our data points that we needed. So uh, the director of research did that before I even came in. And that was using, I mean, systems that were in silos, right? Our operations was in a, a system that was online. It was, uh, could only be used on IE Explorer 7, you know, something really <laughs> weird like that. It could only be pulled from that same system. So it was very kind of like, you know, put a hand crank in front of the computer to get these reports out. We had quarterly reportings around the, the federal cycle. Um, we had an IT staff of two that took a whole month to get our reports out. So four months of the year, we couldn't even touch IT, right? So that's where we were coming from, from this idea when we were a service provider as well. We weren't trying to solve a mission or a problem. And so it was board driven. Our board came in and you met one of our board of directors. Uh, we were very blessed to have Dell in our backyard in Austin. So at any time we have three, call them chiefs, we have three chiefs on our, our board. Um, you saw the chief purchasing officer, but we've had the chief 
operating officer and the chief support officer. And so they have incredible insights. Um, they know what a, a data-driven organization looks like. So we've been blessed in that sense, and we've been a little bit ahead of the curve because of that. But right, our data was everywhere. And when the board asked, how do we know that you're achieving self-sufficiency, we didn't have an answer to that. And we had to go out and search for assessments, standardized assessments. We had to partner with universities in a lot of times. Um, there is a documentary coming out on LifeWorks actually uh, next year about how we took data from our workforce development program. So I'll just talk about that story, then I'll, I'll give the mic to someone else. But our workforce development program, it modeled what you see just about every uh, county workforce development has. Um, differences, we have youth, 16 to 26, vulnerable, and we're trying to apply this model. We would bring them in for how to be a good employee for two weeks, and we would pay them right, for that two weeks to sit in that classroom, and then we'd go find a job for them using uh, our partnerships in the community. And um, lo and behold, you know, they could never hold a job, right? And our number one metric, based on what Travis County, our county, thought was Place job retention, right? So how long do you need to stay in the job? Yeah. And then we said, okay, this isn't, uh, we're going to fail constantly. We need a new model. So we went out and looked for evidence-based practices, right? We found one, um, we actually merged two. There's one in the University of Kansas called Strengths Based. So you talk to them and say, okay, what are your strengths? And we're going to build a plan around your strengths. And then what are your goals in life and how we're going to get you there? And then we found uh, an IP, they call it the IPS model. I don't know what it stands for. That was in uh, Vermont, I think. And it was for uh, people with uh, who had mental health issues and how they could get a job. Hmm. Right, so not exactly our population, but closer. So we adopted that evidence-based model together with another evidence-based model. So now we have all the metrics that we need. Um, we have people who can hold us accountable with audits. And we developed a new system. And what we saw is, it's a really interesting story where when you um, come from a stable family and you get your first job, maybe it's like in a Dairy Queen or something and you're having these awful experiences, and but you're learning. You know, these, uh, these vulnerable youth never had that. Mm -hmm. They never had this exposure, <laughs> right? So we would get them in a job as fast as we can and whatever they wanted, right? And we had a story of one kid, I say kid, one youth, uh, who wanted to be a banker. That's what he said. So we found him a teller job. And um, after about two weeks, he's like, no, this job's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it um, turned out he just liked wearing suits. <laughs> right? So, okay, well, let's talk about some yeah. of your secrets. <laughs> I thought maybe you liked banking hours, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. He just liked wearing suits. And um, he also, uh, you know, is a, is a young male. He, he wanted to get out there, right? And so we actually found him a job that he still has to this day, two years going. He works at Forever 21, <laughs> right? It's perfect. He gets to meet people, he's social, he gets to wear a suit and look good. And who knew, right? And that was with, I mean, we have job guidance, so we have case managers, but we're not sitting them in a classroom for two weeks teaching right. them how to be a good employee. And so we have success. Now we have a story. Now we have data to back it up. Now we go to the state legislator, and we, we bear witness, right? That's, that's, that's been uh, one of our stories. That's awesome. Yeah. I think similar to your guys is, you know, with finding those jobs, you know, like with the IRC because of the refugees that they manage in, in the U.S., self-sufficiency is a big thing. And finding the right type of positions for people who don't necessarily speak the language, aren't familiar with custom, the standard customs in their areas. I mean, there's a lot of things that are very similar in how they have to manage because it's 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 a life. This this They right. came and now it's like everything's new. and. And it is it, how you help is, is so amazing. And you need that data and that information in order to really drive that home. Mm -hmm. So you know, speaking of evidence-based models and the different changes you all have made in your organizations through the, the projects that you've done, um, I'd love to hear what was necessary for those transformations to be successful or to be on the path to being successful if you're not fully through them yet. So obviously, the, 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 the um, data piece right, and the tech piece and so feel free to speak about that. But are there other organizational considerations 
that you think would be helpful to highlight that are critical to the success of these transformations? Anyone dying to go? Yes. All right. go first. <laughs> I'll jump in. Uh, you know, it, when we think about commit and the commit partnership, there's the organization that Ashwina and I work for, but then there's the coalition that we really manage. So while I didn't raise my hand if you asked if we're an affiliated structure, we kind of are in that the data-driven decisions that we have to make and the evidence-based practices that we try and facilitate are often not put into practice by our employees. They are put into practice by teachers in a classroom or superintendents that are leading or district trustee members, child care providers, healthcare hospital systems, right? These are other large, complex, slow moving bureaucracies a lot of the time. And so for us, while our organization was founded on data-driven principles and track it with fidelity, I mean, we are 48 strong of nerds, <laughs> we have to help others come to the bright side, right? Like we really have to be patient, and I think that is one of the, the first lessons that you learn, is that you have to be patient because the truth really is in the field. Yeah we can sit at our desks and churn out information and insights day in and day out, and we walk in the room and they say, yeah, welcome, we've known <laughs> that, where have you been? So meeting, helping us meet them where they are, being patient with the field as they're working in front of computers that need cranks, God, they'd love something that runs on IE7. Right? If you've ever been inside a school district, there are still dot matrix printers that they are churning out attendance reports from. So trying to get that information into any other system, you would have a better shot at just writing it down on a piece of paper. Uh, so moving a field that is archaic. Constant, <laughs> archaic, constantly under scrutiny by everyone who thinks they know better, including us, is a challenge for these folks. So we have to be responsive. We can be honest data brokers who show up and say, how can we help you? And how can we work within the systems that you have now while also being your advocate outside the system? And, and to add on to what Erica is saying, it's completely true, it's all about the coalition. And so much of the time that we spend within the organization is building relationships. So getting the data is kind of opening up the door and having conversations, sitting down, learning, listening is, is where we change behavior and change resources. Do you want to add a little bit about your data council? Yeah. So we have a um, data council, which are the chief um, accountability folks for each of the school districts within our county. And there are 14 school districts within the county. And what we do is just create a space for them to come together and talk. And just that space and uplifting the work that they do gives us insight into what they're doing and what issues that they're facing. Any new research that they might be coming across. Texas recently went from um, a met standard, not met standard accountability system to an A through F accountability system. And just hearing them talk through what that means for each of their school districts allows us to then go and talk to legislatures and to, to the legislature and say, hey, by the way, we're hearing this. Is it making sense? Can we potentially change how we are looking at outcomes? Thanks. So it sounds like a lot of our communication, listening, and figuring out how to then be able to change behavior influence accordingly mm -hmm. to actually hit impact. Just yeah. said more bluntly, yeah. shut up sometimes yeah. mm -hmm. and listen to what they're telling you. So I feel we could get a Monty Python moment going here with, you know, dot matrix printers, sheer luxury. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I think the, the, one of the things I would I'd sort of, one of the quotes I always like in looking at technology is um, William Gibson who said, and this was 1993, he said, the future's already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. Um, and so we know how to do all this stuff. I think there are lots of new tools coming along. The AI stuff is just really amazing. And then you get into ML and, 
you know, some of the tools there. This is incredible stuff we've never had at our fingertips before, and it's amazing to see it just there, like the power of what you can get with Azure, not to be on a sort of Microsoft sales call here, but what you can get at your fingertips today is mind-blowing when you think about where we were 10, 20 years ago, and just the power at our fingertips. But the challenges are really the same that we all know or the, the, in terms of in implementing technology projects. They're really the same challenges we've dealt all along. I think in this space, particularly data and measurement in nonprofits, one of the first ones is just resourcing. So if we compare, um, even at IRC, if we compare what we're doing in finance and operations right now to what we're doing in measurement, and look at the resourcing and look at where we are, there's stark differences here, and this is true throughout the sector. If you go to your CFO and say, we need a new finance system, it's gonna be a million dollars, it's gonna be $10 million, they sort of nod and say, yeah, okay, sounds about right, right? And they'll be there at a steering committee and they'll be one of your project sponsors and they'll make sure it happens. But finance, the standards of double entry bookkeeping have been around since the 13th century. You can go to any country in the world and you can hire a finance director and they know what gap is. And they understand what closing cycles are. So there's a common nomenclature, there's a common set of processes and standards that are already there, right? If you can contrast that to data and measurement, it's, none of this exists. The thought that we're going to measure nonprofits and have data is 10, 10 to 20 years old, maybe a little bit longer in that sense, right? There's massively different, more complex data models that we need to do in terms of thinking about it. Yes, indicators, is, you can get pretty um, simple with that, but the underlying transactional piece of what we're trying to achieve there is massively more complicated than just running a ledger. And yet at the same time, we typically say to programs, can you find five programs that can contribute 10,000 each and we'll put together a data system? So I think resourcing and thinking about it in an enterprise model is, the, is one of the key pieces. Having a strategy is super important. At IRC, our, our CEO, David Miliband, has been focused on evidence-based programming since he first got here five years ago. It's a core pillar of our IRC 2020 strategy. If you go read what he wrote in foreign policy, it's in there. If you look at oef.rescue.org, our outcomes and evidence framework is there and breaks down all of the different programming models we do into their component portions so that we can then attach an evidence base to each thing. So if we're gonna say you need a system of laws, two steps down, people need to be able to affect those laws. And how are we measuring that? What's the evidence in the sector for that? And is there an evidence base that we can contribute to? Is there an evidence base that we should go big and say this is a really key thing in the same way as sort of third grade mm -hmm. children and reading? Um, or is there actually contrary evidence? And we've been doing this because we thought it was a good thing and actually we should stop. And so each of our programmatic um, interventions is measured against that and is, is rated against that. Um, so having that strategy is really important. I think the third thing I'd mention is just the human resources piece of it, right? For every broken system, somebody benefits. So if you know, you're not getting data out of the field, it's because somebody's sitting on their spreadsheet, they have power, they have influence, whatever it is. So setting up the right governance, setting up the right incentives, making people sure people can transition through that. Really thinking about the journey that your staff are on as you do these projects is just incredibly important because you can have the best technology in the world, as we all know, and if people aren't aligned with it, it will fall flat. Thanks. Kyle, you wanna? So uh, I'm not gonna add, a lot was already said, you know, um, we do a lot of the same practices. I mean, obviously we had a board that came from Dell, so it was top down where it's gotta be. Uh, our senior management team, we try to implement technologies first. So like when we went to Teams or Skype for Business, you know, we're the first ones to drop the calls, right? Yeah. We try to implement that one. Um, <laughs> same will be for Teams when we change over, but we, so we could feel the pain up top. We talked about pain and sharing the pain earlier. So we felt the pain top, right? And we knew what the organization was going to go through. We understand the technologies. Um, and, but we also understand how it's going to change the way we do business, mm -hmm. right? So it's always a, a top-down message. Um, so for, for us, it's a very similar story that you guys had. So I don't have much to add, but um, because we were lucky if it came from the top, I, we got to say, setting the culture, um, having, we, we have a, another thing that we do called crucial conversations. Um, being able to voice a different opinion, um, you know, talk about restructuring where it makes sense. So we have a lot of type of in an M and E type positions that have a lot of power, and they're positions that make a lot of sense going to the new models. And how can we bring them back into the fold, into maybe a grants management system or whatnot? So uh, 
I would add that to what you guys said, is being able to uh, have those crucial conversations, and we teach it uh, at our organization. We're going to a training next month, actually. That's good. Thank you. And a lot of what I'm hearing are different facets of change management, really, right? Yeah. Like, so yeah. it's both, you need the technology and the system set up, but you need actually the people to follow suit. And you guys all talked about different parts of that, I think. Yeah. Okay, to raise your hand. Okay. Let me ask one question to, to the, everyone in the room, and then we'll, we'll go to break. So I hope that doesn't mean you're not going to ask, respond to this question. Um, but at risk of that being the case, just to ask everyone in the room, for all of you who are going through your own transformations or thinking about it, what have you found to be helpful in, let's say, either easing that change or accelerating that change? You know, all kind of in line with what we heard from everybody up here. Does anybody have additional considerations to share that would be helpful for others to think about? I should have told you we had break. <laughs> <laughs> if you answer the question, then, then. Exactly. <laughs> changing the rules. Yes, exactly. A couple of hands. Anyone? Anything to share? Yeah. Uh, the CEO and the board support. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> CEO and board support, absolutely. CEO and board support, yeah. absolutely. Has anybody had experience not had CEO and board support for this? And can you share a story of how that didn't work so well? Or you all had it? Looking away or, not, or nodding. Great. But, but, I, but I do think, if you oh, go for it. answer that, we certainly have had clients who have not had it. So have we, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and the, they're sitting here, I think, in, in, in large part be, because they, they do have executive support. There's a couple of common ingredients. Yeah executive support. There's nobody who's more maniacal about data-driven practices than David Milvant that I know, right? Um, so it starts at the top. Um, there's a, a case for change and there's pain that the team sees. They're taking a pragmatic approach to the technology. They're not trying to eat the elephant all at once, starting with a data hub strategy, then evolving your core platforms. Um, and they're thinking about that full change management cycle, knowing that the truth is in the field and that it's hard actually to change, we'll call them end user or field practices. That's really hard stuff and that has to be thought and through. And, and um, this formula is the same formula that we see in enterprise. Um, it is a consistent formula. And when you have those ingredients right, you can make real progress. If any one of those ingredients is missing, it's a struggle, right? And we've certainly seen lots of organizations go on big data strategies, didn't have executive support. We thought the tool was going to solve the problem, and you know we know all know where those projects go. That's right. right. So and I think the other thing I'd add is reinforcement mechanisms, right? So down to incentives yeah. for employees to That's actually right. change behavior. It goes on performance reviews, the whole the whole nine yards. And I'd also add that it, once in a project, even though maybe you felt the executive support in kicking it off, uh, having having steering regular steering committee level meetings, which more often than not it sort of devolve into projects, team meetings, but that's not a steering committee meeting. But having a steering committee meeting that forces those same executives into the room to understand some of the challenges, to understand <coughs> if there is a change coming, that they're bought into it. Because oftentimes, you know, what they perceive to be the project when it started, it may change over time. And the things that they were hoping to get out of it, uh, you know, may, may, need, may be a phase two. You, you may have scaled it back and said, well, we're not even going after that in phase one. And all of a sudden they're, you know, pulling the plug on, on the support for the project because it doesn't have what they needed. But if they were in that regular conversation, they'd understand that and have been bought into it. So just a practical recommendation for steering committee involvement throughout these projects. That's right. Thank you, Alan. And that, I think the, the two parts of that are really interesting. There's absolutely a need for really strong steering, and it's great to have David at the table sort of pushing this um, from a sort of you know, executive point of view. But to your point, the, the field voice needs to be really balanced in there. And yeah. so setting up your governance structure so that you have a structural component of field voices, it's not just after the facts and feedback, but really setting up the right groups to feed into a steering structure is really, really important. So you get that balance throughout. Because otherwise, what happens is, as an example, headquarters will say, well, we need an indicator system in data. We need to measure these indicators. We need this to report out and understand our organizational strategy. And the field is saying, I need to manage donors. And my number one priority day to day and my incentives are around managing donors. And if you don't bring that together and shape that, then it's going to not work in one way or the, the other. Discount. So that's really important that way. Thanks. 